let's 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 talk a little bit. Of, let's have a conversation about disruption. So how how do you know? Or I guess I'm trying to think of the right way to ask this question. Like like we all have these great ideas, right? Like everybody's got these ideas, but then we we hardly ever implement. And then someone else does something, and you're like, man, how come I didn't think of that? Right? Like like <laughs> Uber or like this Task Rabbit or so many other things that are happening, right? Well, the, I think the crazy thing is, is that you can't really predict whether it's going to be disruptive or not. And that's sort of the mythology of like the Silicon Valley startup. And and even inside of these large companies, they kind of figure they can sit around a boardroom table. And if they think really hard, they'll think of some disruption. Mm. And it doesn't really happen that way. And so I think like the example that you brought up, especially in real estate, disruption is happening whether any of us like do anything about it or not. Masters, I just had a great, great conversation with Brent Cooper. We talked about disruption. We talked about innovation. Uh, we talked about change, you know, industries changing, uh, entrepreneurial shift. It was a really cool conversation. I, I think you can get a lot out of it. He's an author of the book, The Lean Entrepreneur. He shares his three E's, which are empathy, experiment, and then evidence-based which I absolutely love. And he also talks about ethics. So great conversation on the digital age and something you want to listen to and pay attention to as a salesperson as well as an entrepreneur. My friends, don't forget about our, our sponsors, Vulcan 7. Uh, check them out for your awesome um, uh, data for sellers, buyers, real estate, the neighborhood, anything you need to connect with people. Vulcan7.com forward slash path to mastery for a special opportunity. And hey, I'd love to see you on our monthly meetup. Always the second Thursday of the month at 4 p.m. Eastern. Go to weloverealestate.net. Again, weloverealestate.net. Jump on our meetup. Be in the conversation with us. My friends, I hope you enjoy Brant. You rock. Masters, welcome to another episode of Path to Mastery. And today we're with Mr. Brant Cooper. Brant, how are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. Thank you. Thanks for being a speaker, author, and disruptor, man. That's uh, what, what's a disruptor anyway, man? Let's just start right there. Let's get right into uh, it. You know, I've been known to you know poke hornets' nests here and there. You know, uh, so yeah, I kind of. I, I I like fixing things, right? I mean, smart analytical people like to break down problems and fix things. Well, you know, sometimes there are people that don't want them fixed. <laughs> mm. Yeah, make things better. That's right. I mean, I right. That's our purpose, I, I think. So, I love that conversation. We'll get back into that too. Um, in a minute, let me just tell tell our listeners a little bit about you. Uh, you are a New York Times bestselling author of The Lean Entrepreneur, CEO of uh, Moves the Needle. Over two decades of experience helping companies bring innovative products to market. You blend uh, agile design thinking and lean methodology. Methodologies. Let me let me get my uh, my grammar in place uh, to ignite entrepreneurial action within large organizations. So uh, thanks for... Uh, and your website is the uh, leanentrepreneur.co. So thanks for, uh, again, joining us today. Yeah, cool. Thanks. Thanks for, for having me. So, so let's, go, let's actually talk about the, uh, the disruption because you know, you're... I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with my audience, but a lot, a lot of salespeople and real estate agents, and uh, especially real estate, we're in an industry that is, is really being disrupted now as we speak. A lot of changes. So... What, let's let's talk a little bit. Of, let's have a conversation about disruption. So how how do you know? Or I guess I'm trying to think of the right way to ask this question. Like like we all have these great ideas, right? Like everybody's got these ideas, but then we we hardly ever implement it. And then someone else does something, and you're like, man, how come I didn't think of that? Right? Like like <laughs> Uber or like this Task Rabbit or so many other things that are happening, right? Well, the, I think the crazy thing is, is that you can't really predict whether it's going to be disruptive or not. And that's sort of the mythology of like the Silicon Valley startup. And, and even inside of these large companies, they kind of figure they can sit around a boardroom table. And if they think really hard, they'll think of some disruption. Mm. And it doesn't really happen that way. And so I think like the example that you brought up, especially in real estate, disruption is happening whether any of us like do anything about it or not, right? So... 
Disruption can be caused by a bunch of different things. Disruption can be caused by technology invention that then you know takes over the world. It could be caused by a global pandemic. Uh, it could be you know caused by other acts of God. I think that the way I describe it nowadays is that we're we're moving. You know, when we moved from an agricultural society to the industrial age. That was massive societal disruption. Everything changed. Education, government, business, the way workers worked. I'm sure even like, you know, real estate was way different, right? But we're going through that level of disruption again. We're going from the industrial age into the digital age. The fact that we're all running around with computers in our pockets, Mm. you know, this is like, I don't know, 10,000 times more powerful than the first computers that were sitting in the very center of governments and corporations back in the 50s or whatever, right? I mean, it's so powerful. We're running around with computers in our pockets and it's changing absolutely everything, absolutely everything about how society functions. So government's going to be restructured. Education's going to be restructured. How we grow and manage businesses is going to be fundamentally restructured. And so digital, this, this disruption based on the digital revolution is kind of happening to us. And so I guess what what I try to teach people and try to help figure out is, well, how do we make it work for us, right? So how do we like not just be passive and this is all happening to us, but how can we actually, you know, go out and try to shape what's happening in order to benefit benefit ourselves and our families and our communities and our and our jobs and our businesses. You know, if we're passive, it's just going to happen to us. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we, you know, sort of learn how to take the bulls by the horn, then, then, you know, maybe we can make it work for all of us. Yeah. Yeah. I was, it was funny. I was talking to somebody early today, uh, on a, a, not on a podcast, but a different, uh, conversation, uh, consulting conversation and the, the, um, blockbuster versus Netflix conference. I actually brought the, con- <laughs> the conversation. I said, listen, if, if, if you could go back to Netflix and, you know, spend Friday night in line and, you know, get a movie. And he's like, yeah, that wouldn't be too bad. I'm like, dude, seriously? Like, and (laughs) (laughs) it's kind of funny. He's like, yeah, he goes, well, he's younger. So he's like, you know what? Honestly, I didn't grow up with that. So that might not be a bad thing, but it's just interesting him saying that because in his mind, it's like, well, that actually doesn't even sound too bad. You know what I mean? To kind of, I actually, I I'm certainly old enough to remember it. I miss the neighborhood video store and I'll tell you why. Because you could go find any video there. It's actually hard to find any video now. Like That's true. And the other thing is, it's gotten more expensive. All of this disruption was was supposed to make this stuff inexpensive. Listen, all of these stores, these streaming services, they don't have like brick and mortar stores. They don't have to manage discs. They don't Mm. have to buy new, you know, all of that hardware infrastructure is gone. And yet prices go up. It's insane. Well, you don't have to leave your house, though. I mean, you don't have to do any. You don't have to drive. You don't have to. You don't even have to cook dinner anymore, right? You can have somebody uh, delivering dinner every night. It's. I know. I'm terrible, though. Like when I was, I guess when I was married, I enjoyed walking down the street, grabbing a pint at the local pub while I'm picking up the movie and coming back. I mean, that was like it was. It, it, there's a social aspect that that young person's talking about that yeah. actually is. It is valuable, and and having to get in your car maybe and drive you know, 20 minutes through 300 stoplights is maybe, yeah, it's great to avoid that. But I, back in the day, you know, I could walk down the street. That was pretty nice. Hey, I, I still remember, you know, selling in, uh, in 1985, you, there were no cell phones. There was no GPS. You right. You used, you had a map. You, you took the map with you, the big book, <laughs> right. And then the evolution yeah. from that was you'd go on to the computer and print like, you know, the map quest was there. Now you could print pages and bring those with you. It's uh, it's just it's nuts how different it is right now. It I mean, is, but it. You, I'm sorry, you go, you go. Oh, I was just gonna say. It just reminds me that story. Reminds me of that transition period where I had like uh, a phone uh, that had like really poor battery, and and so you know you'd get off of the plane or whatever, and you'd be in a city, and you'd be trying to download the the map because you had to figure out how to get to your hotel, and then the mm. then the phone would like it would uh, die. And so then you actually had to like go and plug the in at the airport on the arrival side so you could call UberX or tell the taxi driver. I don't know. It was kind of funny. There was that period where it was actually not quite in the new era and not quite out of mm. the old era that uh, that was kind of painful. But 
it's pretty pretty easy now. Yeah, I think it's every everything. It's it's all perspective, right? I mean, I I it's almost like you can't survive now without a tell a cell phone or or navigation. Uh, you don't even need navigation in a car anymore, right? Because it's on your <laughs> yeah. phone now. That used to be a big deal, right? You buy a car, you get navigation. It's like. It's yep. uh, it's just amazing how things just continue to exponentially just uh, evolve and get better and and uh, more efficient. So what I mean, what would you say to somebody listening to this, like when it comes to like innovation and technology and like because things are changing so fast, it's it's hard to keep up sometimes. Well, you know, it's really funny. I'm going to go back to what that that young person said to you again. I actually think that you got to zag when everybody else is zigging. And I think people are becoming over-reliant on the technology to automate stuff. Mm -hmm. And your audience knows, both of them, real estate and salespeople know, it's all really about the human connection and the relationships that you establish. And so while everybody else is trying to computerize all of that, automate all of that, the more human you make it, I actually think that puts you a, a, a step ahead. And even though there's so much technology your competitive advantage is not the technology anymore because everybody has it. So it's not mm. even that patents don't matter that much to most startup entrepreneurs. It's the insights that you get into your customer that are your competitive advantage. And so what I would say to your audience about technology, great, leverage it how you need it. Don't leverage it just because it's a cool tool. Leverage it how you need it, but maintain the ability to discover insights about your customers that nobody else has. And that's your competitive advantage. I love it. Yeah, that's great advice. I, you know, it's funny. I was on a call yesterday or, or meeting with a guy. He's a huge... He's in, His company's called Get Leverage. And uh, they basically automate everything. Like that's what they specialize in. But something interesting he said was that, you know what? The first thing we do with people is we look at their systems and their processes. And then we decide what should be automated and what shouldn't be automated. Because frankly... Some things doesn't make sense to automate. Like people try to automate too much now. Where oh. you know, so if you could take your assistant three seconds to do something, why automate it? Right when it's it's might not it might work out better by having her spend the, you know ten seconds to do it. Yeah, I was I was helping this entrepreneur in Australia once, and he was trying to sell software to restaurants, and uh, and so obviously if you're going to sell you know, the software system to a restaurant, you got to get in touch with the owner or the manager, whoever makes that decision. And yet he was posting this stuff on some sort of Facebook group. And mm -hmm. I asked him, I go, well, why are you trying to find restaurant managers in this Facebook group? I mean, that's most likely you're hitting whatever social media consultant they've hired or whatever. And he said, yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, I said, you should be cold calling them. And he's like, yeah, my investor says that's not scalable. And I'm all like, Mm. Yeah. What's not scalable is no sales. I mean, that's not scalable. Yeah. And so, you know, the whole hustle aspect of it gets lost often in the automation. And so, you know, what you should, the way I try to think about it is, is you automate marketing is automating the part of sales process you've already figured out. Mm. So you go figure out something in, in, in person, right? And so you're a seasoned, you're a renaissance salesperson who knows how to actually go learn how to overcome objections. Okay, well, so I hear the same five objections every time. Okay, now I'm gonna use, I'm gonna create a frequently asked questions page and put that on my website. And I'm gonna steer my, my people to that web, my audience to that website because I wanna overcome those objections before I even talk to that person on the phone. So now I've just automated what I just learned in person. The yeah. learning in person is key. The automation, Hopefully saves time and, and creates you know sales capacity and and velocity, um, but you have to learn it in person first and then automate what you've learned. Yeah, great point. Yeah, absolutely. We're, what we're doing is in real estate right now, creating these uh, similar to what you just said, consumer awareness guides. Essentially, it's a way to give people information without selling them or pushing them on it. Like answer all the questions that they have in their mind ahead of time. So. That when they decide to make a choice, um, obviously we're gonna, you know, be top of mind at the least, and maybe we'll get a shot at it. But it's really just about giving information and answering those questions and dealing with those objections ahead of time. Really similar. Yeah. Let me ask you this because you know you said the 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 magic question. Everybody says, well, that's not scalable these days. 
is is that just like is that like the thing to say now to sound cool or do yeah. you have to <laughs> do people even know how to scale like right it's like cuz yeah it's it's actually you could scale cold calling you could hire ISAs you could hire a sales team to make those calls for you but like why do people say it's not cuz i hear that so many times now every day yeah because because people tend to look at the successes out there after the boulder is tipped over the top of the mountain and is rolling downhill. And they go, wow, look how big that and powerful that boulder is and how fast it's moving. And they can't see King Sisyphus, you know, pushing that boulder up the hill for, for mm. you know, years and years and years. All of the learning and the iterating and the failing and all of those things that got the boulder to the top of the hill. And so the, the, the scalable part is... They just want to be at the top of the hill now. Exactly. Right. No, exactly. And so it's like, oh, no, see how they do it when the bowler's running downhill? Do that. And it's like, no, but we haven't, we don't have the product right yet. And so like the number, the two biggest things that kill Silicon Valley style startups, one is there's not a big enough market. And number two is premature scaling. And so, you know, you see some of these horror stories, uh, you know, Uber was one and, and, uh, the co-working space, uh, what was it, at work or whatever that was, we work. We, yeah. um, and what happens is that the investors are just trying to flip their shares. So this happened during the dot-com boom too, right? Is they don't really care whether the company is viable or if they figured stuff out. If as an early investor, I can convince the retail market that this thing's going to be huge. And so I can flip my shares at Cash a huge out, profit. Yeah then that's actually a lot of the reasons why the big venture capitalists and, and private equity attempt to scale prematurely. But when you hear it in the small world, like this Australian you know, investor or whatever, he's just copying the big boys. He just doesn't, he doesn't really understand. He probably actually was never you know, growing a business, him or herself. And so they're just sort of, you know, that's why it's like you said, it's hip. You know, Sounds just, cool, man. Hey. Yeah. Exactly. It's not scalable. I can't do that. It's not scalable, I don't, man. <laughs> I don't want to do anything. As a matter of fact, I just want to turn on a system that pours money into my bank account. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. That's it. Yep. If Redfin can do it and Zillow can do it, I can do it. Right. right? Yeah, That's right. real estate. Well, let me, let, so let's switch gears. I want to talk about your book, The Lean Entrepreneur. Tell, tell us about the book. What's the, uh, what's the essence of the book? Yeah. Well, so the, the, the Lean Entrepreneur, the fundamental part of it is around this entrepreneurial spirit. And, uh, and really that entrepreneurial spirit is about uh, empathy. So understanding your customers deeply. It doesn't mean going out and asking them what they want and doing what they say, but it's understanding why they're saying what they're saying. It's understanding what the outcome is. And a matter of fact, again, I think a lot of you know, renaissance, what we used to call renaissance salespeople or consultative salespeople know how to do that anyway, because that's, they know that's how they're going to close a deal. But so it's, it's the understanding that human being, um, but it's not necessarily just going and then building what they say. You have to understand the environment, the culture, the real needs that they're driving at. And then the second E in my three E's, empathy, the second E is, is experiment. So here's I'm going to run disciplined, purposeful experiments to validate or invalidate my assumptions. And again, you know, a lot of great salespeople do this all the time, right? I'm, I, here's my sales script, try it. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to change it. Well, that was an experiment. And when it didn't work, I iterate on it until I find what works. Now I can take that sales script and pass it on to the other people who are, you know, sort of the more turnkey salespeople. They can't figure that out, but give me a script, I can go do it. So the experiment like in a product development point of view, is the same thing. Are people willing to pay for it? Well, I can run an experiment to see if they might you know, pull out their wallet and see if they'll, they'll pay for something. Um, so there's all sorts of assumptions that are built into a business model. And we can run purpose-built experiments to try to see if the customer will behave in a way that indicates that they want the value and they're willing to pay the value. And we can cut through all of our assumptions rather than you know, building out a whole sales team or, or building out a whole product for several years, building stuff that nobody wants. I want to mm. experiment to try to figure it out before I invest too much time, money, and resources. And then the 30 is evidence-based decision-making. So, or evidence-informed. I think 
you know, intuition and experience is important, but you also want to be able to leverage those insights I talked about earlier, as well as data, because those will cut through our biases. Like, what is it that I really want versus what is the market telling me? And so the evidence is market-based evidence that instructs what my next step should be. And so those are sort of the three founding, you know, fundamental principles of, of lean entrepreneur. Interesting. That's awesome. Um, it's, I, I'm trying to think of like how to apply those into real estate. Like obviously empathy when you're, you're working with people, um, you know, figuring out what, you know, what the goal is, how can you help them achieve that? What are some of the challenges? Um, experiment, you know, it's, it's, uh, the crazy market right now, honestly. Yep. I mean, we're putting properties on the market at, you know, what I would think a house would sell for five hundred thousand is selling for like six twenty. It's insane. Yep. And is and then if you go to the evidence part, well, evidence is showing that the appraisal should come in at <laughs> five twenty five. For somehow this house is coming in at six hundred thousand. So it's just it's a little strange right yeah. now. <laughs> Yeah. So the way I would apply this stuff is probably in the marketing and maybe programs that you're trying, right? I mean, so at like at a very basic level, you can run experiments to see like, okay, well, what's the messaging that will work now during the pandemic for me? What will get me people coming and knocking on my door and ringing my bell or calling me versus the competition, right? So you can run experiments, but it's I, I try to differentiate between just throwing stuff against the wall and actually thinking about it in terms of a, of a hypothesis. If I do X, Y percentage of my potential customers will behave in way Z. And so I'm going to predict what that is. So if I, you know, if I run a particular Facebook ad with this particular messaging, then this is what's going to happen when these people land on my website and download you know, one of these uh, documents that you're talking about. So you put it inside of an experiment because that allows you to then judge whether it's working or not. Mm. And it's not just like a finger in the wind. <clears throat> it's like, no, I'm seeing an uptick in the number of people that are contacting me. So that messaging's working. I'm going to double down on that. And so the evidence comes from running the experiment or the evidence comes from the empathy work where, where you hear about like, you know, what's really keeping these people up at night, you know, um, and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, I got it. Okay. So, I mean, like, example, if you're running AB ads on Facebook, yeah. right? Or you send out an email campaign, you got AB testing. That's send right. out with this title versus this title, which title is getting a lot more opens, et cetera. Right. That's a, that's a great example of a very, you know, straightforward digital experiment. Mm -hmm. um, what we do when we're, when we're working with startups or, or corporates, they can be really elaborate experiments. I mean, you can do whole pop-up stores that are, are essentially an experiment. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, again, during the pandemic, it's pretty, it's pretty difficult. But if you could imagine like, uh, I mean, it's just kind of like trying to quote unquote, think out of the box, you know, go do a pop-up store at a, at a, uh, at a farmer's market, you know, where you're giving away free water and also you've got your real estate stuff there or something. I mean, just like, yeah. it's being entrepreneurial, right? It's trying to like, how do I zag when everybody else is zigging and run an experiment to see if that actually makes me stand out. And if it stands out, then the evidence will suggest that you're standing out. And then that's a, a you know, a, a program that you should double down on. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let me ask you this. So biggest challenge you can help our listeners overcome um, the loss of entrepreneur, loss of entrepreneurial spirit. Um, what, do, what do you mean by that? Well, I think that we get we get stuck in best practices. We get stuck in how we've always done it. We can get into these routines. You know, one of the things that was interesting to me. So I'm working with you know large enterprises. We go into the pandemic. And they're not going to do any more innovation work. And I'm talking to the leaders and they're saying like, well, we just need to buckle down. And I go, well, when you tell me that you just want to buckle down, what you're telling me is that you just want to go back to what you know and you want to execute harder in order to hit your numbers. And I go, but what do you know anymore? Your small business customers are going out of business. Your consumers don't have any budget. You're going to go, go try to sell them harder during this time? Is that actually going to result in you hitting your numbers? So that's an example of them getting into execution mode where the only thing that they kind of can think of doing is executing harder. Whereas if they paused and they said, well, 
let me apply entrepreneurial spirit because we're facing all of this uncertainty and we don't really know what to do. So the entrepreneurial spirit would be, well, why don't I pick up the phone and talk to five of my customers and just see how they're doing? And seeing, and then using that information to figure out if there's a way that I can provide value to those customers that will also benefit me and my business. And so here's a couple of ideas that we come up with. You know, we get a team of people around, we brainstorm ideas on how we might fix our current situation. Well, so then you run experiments to test those ideas. So that's starting to apply what I could call the entrepreneurial spirit when you're facing this uncertainty instead of just doubling down on what you were doing six months ago because it mm-hmm. worked six months ago. Yeah, I get it. So you're, so you're getting outside of the norm, the thinking outside of the box a little bit. You know, yeah. you know what's actually been uh, interesting is um, real estate has evolved since the pandemic where it's, it's really made us look at a lot of the things, maybe it, we've created a lot more efficiencies, at least not, not, maybe not every agent, but like my last four or five listing, and I don't go in as many listing presentations anymore. I do more coaching now, but um, I like to still go to stay sharp and I focus on, you know, higher end properties. And I've been doing these presentations via zoom and, and it's, it's, it's much more efficient. It's I'm able to actually pull up and show, you know, my presentation, yeah. I feel like it's even better. Yeah. Right. And uh, it's, I don't know. I, I actually love it. <laughs> I, I no, think it's I've... helped. And then the virtual, you know, it's like you using Matterport tours, you're using all these virtual, I think the next thing is like virtual reality headsets where you're going to do tours of the house. I don't know. I just see a lot of things happening in the real estate world. Yeah, no, I think it'll be... Well, what's funny to me is about none of it was predictable, right? I mean, if everybody was going to guess, they would have guessed that everything was going to crash. And so what we've seen is a decline in real estate in downtown San Francisco and downtown New York, and it's going up everywhere else. There's no inventory. Yeah, it's just even... is completely unpredictable, I think. Uh, But anyway, I think there is some benefits out of this in the sense that everybody's kind of you know, become acclimated to video, right? And so there's a way now to do even the empathy work that I'm talking about. You've got a bunch of people on your webinars. The questions that you're getting there, that's way more efficient way for you to learn what the needs are of your even your own audience because you're doing all of this stuff on video. Yeah. So I hope that that... Uh, I hope part of that uh, remains. Um, I also think what's interesting is all sorts of the specialty video tools that are coming out now, right? I mean, before it was like Zoom and that was about all we had. And now you've got all sorts of very specific communications platforms uh, for specific markets. So like you're talking about a virtual reality for a uh, for real estate, you could do like somebody's going to come up with virtual reality where you're still showing the house. Like you've got an avatar there and you're leading a couple yeah. through their avatars. So it's going to be like completely redoing what it was, you know, 10 years ago Absolutely. instead of just forcing everybody to do that on their own. So then that relationship gets reestablished, which yeah. is exciting, right? I mean, I think that that's like, we all just thought like, oh, nobody's going to read books anymore and nobody needs real estate agents anymore and nobody needs this anymore. But that was just this intermediate period where you get beyond that and technology gets sophisticated enough, it will replicate what we did before all of the technology, mm. just sort of online. And so the relationships reform and reestablish. And, and so, yeah, the people that are out there on the cutting edge of that stuff, you know, they have the advantage because they'll get those customer insights first. Yeah. yeah. I think a good example of that is um, well, I, I think going backwards a little bit, like you talked about earlier, you know, sometimes just getting on the phone with somebody and having a conversation. Or, I mean, if you think about like um, what's it, A- Amazon going out and buying Whole Foods, you know, it's it's almost contradictory to what Amazon, right? Like you got this online digital marketplace and then they go and buy a, a chain of stores where people can actually go and yeah. pay astronomical <laughs> amounts of yeah. money to shop. But it's the community, right? Yeah. I think you know, bringing that back is, you know, I think that, that's important right now. I think it's going to come back. I did, so I, I did an interview with the CEO of a bank in Australia and her bank was already digitized before the pandemic. And but a lot of the competition wasn't. And so right when the pandemic hit, again, they did this zagging while everybody else was zigging. All of the other banks are all like, 
here's how you do internet banking. Here's how you can sign up for internet banking. And instead, this bank said, listen, we're in the same situation you are. This sucks. Everybody's home. If you actually just want to talk to somebody, give us a call. And we'll just like... And here's free consultation for financial services mm. because we know that you're running into uh, problems. And so to me, that's a great example of what you're saying is that the next zag is going back to the human relationships, but with the technology where it's beneficial, but it's just that technology can't replace our human relationships. Yeah. I'm actually doing a presentation in February and, and the presentation is called... Ironically, you've talked about the phone call, the phone a couple of times. It's called the gold mine in your pocket. And it's <laughs> about picking up the phone and getting, you know, not just all the people in the phone, like your database, but we all have these huge CRMs that we just rely on sending, you know, emails and all this other uh, totally, stuff. Man. And, and no, that's great. So much opportunity. It drives, <laughs> it drives me crazy. My company was as big as 16, 17 people a couple of years ago. Uh, I shrunk it back down because I was tired of managing everybody to be honest. But one of the things that drove me crazy was that it would take two or three things to get days to get things done because everybody was relying on the digital aspects of the phone instead of the mm, communications. Great, yeah, great it's example. It's like Slack this, that, you know, yeah, yeah. emails, back and forth. And I'm like, pick up the freaking yeah, phone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know what a lot, what's happening uh, lately, and I, I've noticed this, is kind of a new trend of um, like using Loom. Are you familiar with Loom? Yeah. Yeah. Like just a short video, like, hey, here's what's up. And, and instead of even, you don't even have to have a meeting now, right? It's it's a way totally. to actually eliminate meetings. And so it's, it's awesome. I, I love it. You know, I love it. And I love the philosophy too. I don't know, about 10 years ago, I was talking to a guy that does, he was, does lean, lean selling. And I'm sure that you've, you've run into this and have talked about it, but you know, the amount of time it takes uh, between when you can answer a question and when you have to go and find the answer and then give it to, I mean, that could be the time it takes to lose the deal, right? So back in the day, when I was living through the dot-com world, it was super common for the salesperson to either have to go back and ask engineering a question about something before they could give that technical response to whoever they were trying to sell. And so it was actually, you know, if it took a couple of days, you were, you were okay. Today, you don't have a couple of days. Yeah. And so if you have a loom, that's awesome. Or, you know, you have to get your, your own ability yourself to be able to answer those questions. But that's why like a, a database of looms is perfect, right? Because like, you can sure. send that response right away. You have to close that gap or you'll yeah. lose the deal. Or, or just a short, hey, uh, I'm going to send, you know, send you a quick, like, hey, you got a question? Here's the answer to the question, right? Without having to go type everything and... Yep. You know, make sure it's precise and just like, bang. It's, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah. All right. So let me ask you this. Um, well, first off, how do our listeners get a copy of your book? How do they get in touch with you if they want to learn more about what you're up to? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I'm Brant Cooper on all social media. I've got uh, uh, a Brant's rant on YouTube that I do every every week that's kind of fun. Uh the book is, you know, all available on, on Amazon. I've got a new book project. I just turned in the manuscript a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so that'll be out in 2021. And if people want to uh, ask me about that, that's cool. Uh, but generally, Brant Cooper on all social media, brant to brantcooper.com. If you want to send me an email, you know, I respond to everybody. So yeah, look forward to... Uh, to uh, You actually respond people. to all your emails? You don't have like a bot doing it for you? No, I, I, <laughs> I, I respond to all of those as long as they're not spamming me. And then, and yeah. then I, you know. <laughs> Got it. All right. Fair enough. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, I mean, you, uh, you had sent a question, uh, you know, and it was, um, why, is so, why, why is there so much disruption occurring now? So I know we talked a little bit, of, we, we did talk about disruption, but I, I, I don't know that we answered that question. Or maybe yeah, I mean, we did. I, I, I think that, that that was really the, I think it's the digital revolution. I mean, I think so. It mm. just is rippling through all aspects of society. And uh, and and so uh, I actually think it's, I think it's, you know, the source of a lot of turmoil in the world because people are anxious and they don't really know what's happening except that things, you know, there's like, uh, I put this sentence in my book, but right there, there's that old phrase that says, you know, uh, if you keep trying, 
if you keep doing the same thing and expecting dis- different results, that's the definition of insanity, right? That's sort of the cliche. Well, what if you keep trying the same thing and you accept, expect the same results, but now it doesn't work anymore? Mm. Right? I mean, so that's, that's fear. That's anxiety. That makes people super uncomfortable. And so I think that that's a lot of the turmoil in the world right now, to be honest, is people just like, stuff doesn't work anymore. And government doesn't work anymore. And education isn't preparing our kids anymore. And our work, you know, keeps like reorganizing and laying off and, and, uh, and they, they can't grow anymore. And so it's like stuff just isn't working. And so people are like understandably anxious about it. And that's the disruption that we feel. And that's really what the next book is about and why we, why we need to change how we act and how we, you know, sort of bring, bring our knowledge and experience to the world uh, in order to like make this stuff work again. It, it, we'll get, a, I'm optimistic. We'll get, we'll get around the corner. Um, but I really think that it's on us to do it, not us sitting back and waiting for, you know, government and philanthropists and, and, uh, and big tech. <laughs> they're, they're, mm. I, I'm not sure they have our best interest at heart. So we gotta, we gotta do it ourselves. And it's really along those same lines I was talking about empathy, experiment, evidence, finding a balance in our life. I call equilibrium and then applying ethics. And I think that last one is super important. We can't lose sight of, of our values. Uh, and, and so we, we need to treat each other, uh, with respect and with, with ethics. Um, and that's how we will, we'll get around this corner and, and make the, the world a better place. Awesome, man. Well, Hey, I, I just want to say, I appreciate you. I, I may have to back this up and steal that last quote there for Facebook. When you talked about the, uh, and I, I know the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and expecting a different result. But the other one, I think you had said like the definition of frustration is like doing Something that's always working and all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. Exactly. <laughs> and you're exactly. still trying to do it, right? Something exactly. along those lines. I don't know if I'm saying it right, but no, that's that's good. Yep. No, that's exactly right. All right, my friend. Anything I didn't ask you that I should have? Anything I missed? No, I don't think so. It's a fun conversation. All right. Well, it's nice to meet you. Appreciate your time. And yeah, man. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Hey, Masters, I want to thank you for checking out the show. My friends, if you made it this far, it means you listened to the whole show. And I just want to say, listen, I so appreciate you. And hey, again, just thanks. That's all I can say. Thanks. Listen, if you love the show to please give us a review, give me a review, go to Apple iTunes podcast. Give me a review. It helps tremendously. It helps us get more listeners, more downloads, also better guests, which also benefits you. And here's the other thing. If you email me your review, so post it, email it to me at david at davidihill.com and I will read it on air for you. I just want to say, listen again, appreciate you. Don't forget about our sponsors. As always, real estate agents, vulcan7.com forward slash path to mastery. It's the best tool for prospecting out there for real estate agents, vulcan7.com forward slash path to mastery. Every, my friends, every second Thursday of the month, we have our meetup. It's actually a live open podcast episode where you can be part of the conversation. You can ask questions of our guests. Every second Thursday of the month, just go to weloverealestate.net. We love real estate.net. Get signed up right now. It doesn't matter when you sign up, you'll always be alerted for the next one coming. It's at 4 p.m. Eastern. So again, we love real estate.net, second Thursday of the month, 4 p.m. Eastern. And finally, my friends, try coaching.net. If you want to try a coaching call, maybe you've been thinking about coaching, maybe it's something that's been on your mind and you're just not really sure. Let's jump on a call. I'm happy to work with you. Give you a 30-minute coaching call on me, complimentary. Listen, you're a listener to Path to Mastery. It's the least I can do. And at the end of that, if you want to move on with some coaching, that's fantastic. If you choose not to, that's fine as well. You may know someone else that wants to take advantage of it. It's not even about that. It's about bringing you value, my friend. So go to trycoaching.net. Get registered for that 30-minute call. I want to help you with anything you're dealing with. Whether it's a challenge, it's a big idea, it's a it's a goal, whatever it is, we want to help you work through that. So again, trycoaching.net. My friends, again, thank you for listening to the show and enjoy the rest of your day.